Welcome back to Building Tomorrow, a show about tech, innovation, and the future. I have a bit of a throwback today. It's been a while since we've done a Building Tomorrow roundtable. So we have some blasts from the past. Will Duffield, policy analyst at Cato's Center for Representative Government, and Matthew Feeney, Director of Emerging Technology at the Cato Institute. Welcome to the show, Will. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Great to be back. Glad to be back. All right, so a lot has been going on, obviously, in the tech sector this year. Um, a bit of a mixed bag, too. I mean, obviously, every, everyone's been focused on the pandemic, on um, you know everything from research teams, you know what what the big pharmaceutical companies are pouring resources into doing. Uh, lots of delays, I, I think, um, in general, uh, tech research on a lot of fronts as attention turns, as capital shifts in the market. So I wanted to check in, see where we're at in the tech sector. And in particular, I think let's start by um, talking about the tech lash. I had uh, Alex Stapp uh, uh, and come on the uh, show a few months ago early on during the pandemic. And I asked him, you know, is the tech lash over or not? And in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, people's like public opinion about the about big tech, about the tech sector had actually been goosed by the pandemic as it tied people together uh, who were in isolation during the COVID crisis. Um, does it look the same way a few months out um, or are we back into the tech lash conversation? What do you think, Will? Unfortunately, I think that the tech lash is over, is over. Um, <laughs> as as the pandemic has, has spun on, we've really seen two phenomena that I think have, have cut at that nice Goldilocks period we were enjoying um, in the spring and early summer. Um, first of all, as platform moderation has really stepped up to combat disinformation, you've seen a kind of reset of expectations. Um, those who hope to see platforms do more um, to combat extremism, nasty sentiment, that sort of thing. Um, now have this coronavirus misinformation model that they can say, well, why can't you come down just as hard on whatever it is that's, that's upset us from antiquities trading to terrorism? So that's, that's unfortunately provided a bit of a model um, or a, a desirable model for some of what moderation could look like elsewhere. As well, you've seen the, these platforms, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, increasingly used as the lockdowns have continued, as the pandemic has churned on, to express complaints about how this has been going, the effect of lockdowns, and as platforms have attempted to, to uh, manage disinformation in, in light of these complaints, which will often weave legitimate concerns about the effect of lockdowns with conspiracy about why they've been imposed. You've seen a lot of concerns on the right about how that impacts political speech. And it's, it's again, energized those who want to see platforms do more because they've seen this um, upswing in, in radical speech. I mean, I suppose this is, I mean, there was a, there's a Pandora's box effect here, which is that if they can do it in this one area, if they can combat lies and disinformation, et cetera, as they've, you know, I, I think there's been mixed results with how effective that anti-COVID disinformation campaign has been. But now every kind of interest group has its own fish to fry. It says, well, if you can do it there, why can't you combat X? That that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, if you are one of these big social media platforms, if you're Facebook or Twitter or whoever, like what's your response to those to those calls for even more action? Like, I mean, how do you think they're they're going to field this pressure? I think you have to parse the pandemic out as something truly novel. You have to look at perhaps where where states have been able to step back from the state of exception in the past without sacrificing liberties going forward. And that's always been difficult there. There aren't too many success stories that way. Uh, but the posture adopted by platforms in the wake of of this uh, pandemic has really been akin to, to that of states in a time of war. I think, unfortunately, because it has churned on for so long, then 
disinformation concerns and pandemic specific disinformation concerns have become ever more entangled with broader politics and and therefore it, it becomes harder to make that case for separateness for the uniqueness of of the moderation that that disinformation demanded um but unfortunately i think we're we're almost past that that point i i have wondered maybe we can revisit brass tacks a bit here. I do think that the optimists in the tech lash conversation, you know, people like Kale Watt and the Alex Stapp, I mean, they're right that the broad public doesn't have strong negative feelings towards big tech. I mean, routinely, Amazon is at the top of the corporate, you know, uh, goodwill charts. People, you know, love Prime and get into packages so they don't have to go out. And, um, and, while some companies, individual companies, suffer by those metrics, things like Facebook, which has a popularity issue, a growing popularity issue over the last couple of years, in general, people, you know, there's not some broad public um, public opinion behind uh, taking on big tech or government regulators taking on big tech, which raises the question, and I, I frankly don't have a, a single good answer for this. Where is the tech lash coming from? If it's not some like groundswell of public opinion that's driving this issue, why the tech lash? I think there's a interesting political answer to that question, and it's not interesting just because I'm I'm saying it. Uh, but by which I mean, uh, the, I I think once you put the current tech environment into a broader political context, um, more of this makes sense. Which is, I think, we're in the middle of some kind of political realignment where. Uh, rather elite politicians on both sides of the aisle see uh, populism as a worthwhile avenue. And especially today, um, not so much in content moderation, but in antitrust, I think you do see uh, there being some agreement. I mean, some of my optimism about tech policy for a while was motivated by the fact that, uh, at least in content moderation, the left and the right couldn't seem to make up their minds about what the issue was. And it seemed unlikely that you could get some sort of bipartisan content moderation legislation through, uh, you know, court, uh, First Amendment uh, problems notwithstanding. However, with antitrust, you do have um, concerns from the left and the right uh, that I think do yield themselves much more favorably to some kind of bipartisan uh, push, uh, which, which is uh, somewhat concerning. And um, I don't think it's a surprise that most Americans aren't thinking much about the nitty gritty of antitrust policy. And we should also remember there's no, it's not mutually exclusive to say that you like Amazon Prime, but also think that they might be too big, right? This is, I, I think, um, probably quite a, a decent chunk of America do enjoy and use uh, YouTube, Google, Amazon, while also um, having their own uh, their own concerns. And uh, th that I think is something, regardless who wins the election uh, next month, I think we will continue to see discussions about uh, not only content moderation, but also antitrust. Mm. Well, this gets to Will's, I, I think you were going here, Will, with the technocratic elites. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, the, the median American isn't concerned with the ins and outs of antitrust policy, but there are voices in the kind of DC technocratic circle, which are yeah, and I was thinking more about the the cross cut partisan wise of of this conversation. Um, in that, on one hand, you do have both major party candidates for president um, talking about modifying two hundred and thirty somehow on on day one. At the same time, they're talking about doing it for completely countervailing reasons, and both sides' partisans would look askance and find unacceptable uh, the solutions proposed by the other side. So that lends it a certain amount of stability, even as you hear these sort of continual complaints from, from both sides. Mm. Even if there's not some broad general constituency that's, that's politically motivated, you know, that gets to the polls out of a desire to take down big tech a notch, um, there's clearly some sort of advantage there. I mean, there are – And no I'm, punishment. I'm thinking here of – There's no, no cost seemingly in, in the face yeah, of yeah, widespread yeah. support for Amazon. You nevertheless have both major party candidates calling for right. decisive government action to harm the firm. And you have, you know, freshman senators like Josh Hawley, freshman, you know, congresspeople who are raising their national profile by 
positioning themselves as the defenders of the public of the common wheel against big tech. So it clearly works politically, even even in the absence of um, but that's a good point. I also wonder to what extent there's some anti-competitive rent seeking going on here. I, I mean, I have in mind you know, that I think the Supreme Court is currently considering the Oracle v. Google case, um, which is a bit of a is more adjacent to this topic. Um, but to what extent this is uh, companies jostling, right? Like Apple. The, the interests of Apple and Google are not aligned when it comes to social media, when it com comes to content moderation, when it comes to... Um, and so now we're starting to see this breakout of internet companies that might have once presented more of a united front, but now are going to approach the issue of potential antitrust action or Section 230 reform um, with different interests. Like their interests no longer align in the way we might once have assumed. What do you think of that? Well, it has been interesting uh, to watch some of the uh, hearings this year uh, on on this issue. Uh, there was a, a hearing earlier this year that included uh, you know, the CEOs of, of Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft. And while um, it, it's interesting to hear people describing these companies as monopolies, despite the fact that they do in, in some sectors compete with each other, uh, one of the overriding concerns here is something libertarians have talked about for a while, which is regulatory capture, right? Which is these these companies will oppose regulations and significant reforms up until the point they view them as inevitable. And then they'll probably have an influence in what the regulations look like after, after they pass. Uh, and that is a serious concern, uh, I think, because something I, I've, I've noticed is not enough uh, Section 230 reformers or antitrust people seem to think that this is a problem, uh, that, that, that uh, these, these companies respond to, to incentives in important ways. And, and that, that's concerning to me. Uh, and, and even if I don't think that legislation is likely, in, especially in Section 230, nonetheless, I think it is uh, still politically viable. So if you ask someone on the left, you know, did you know that the American right views Facebook and YouTube as giant censors, they, they would just laugh at you. And you think of, you know, how successful many conservatives have been online. Uh, but that doesn't really matter to conservatives speaking to conservatives. Um, meanwhile, if you're on the left, uh, you have your own category of complaints. So it, although it, the, these claims of um, content moderation censorship might not be well placed or empirically grounded, uh, they're not going to stop being politically useful for the Josh Hollies of the world anytime soon. Um, and that, that, is a, that is a concern. And at, at scale, it, it just becomes very difficult to dispose of them because we can point to countless conservatives who are doing well on, on social media. And yet someone can turn around and point to a host of people who've been banned and, and who aren't as visible, who've suffered harms career-wise. And Without a way to compare those universes of anecdotes, you don't end up with a productive conversation. You can't prove much of anything. I think it's an interesting, it's, it's a good observation, which is that we're downstream from the, these big divides in American society, which is one of which is that we consume our media in very different ecosystems. So folks who are on the right have a, a, a very, relatively little information out, you know, uh, media outlet consumption overlaps with people on the left. They often read different papers, they visit different websites, they listen to different voices online and offline. And so you can have, you know, if you're if you're sitting at ten thousand feet, and if you're a kind of a tech policy wonk like we are, you you hear both conversations simultaneously. And you say, hey, wait a second, these are dissonant. They clash, right? They don't work together. There's um, but they would you wouldn't know that in your little media side in your media silo on the right or the left. Well, and so unfortunately, when when these companies make content moderation decisions, they end up having to adopt one of those differing contexts over another. When when you deem Kyle Rittenhouse a mass shooter as as Facebook, you're, you're choosing to accept that context for his actions rather than one preferred by his supporters. And that will always land you in political hot water because they're binary decisions between differing sets of facts. 
And you're not even, uh, if you're one of these institutions, you're not even helped if you try and kick this decision to, to another institution. So, for example, in the ongoing pandemic situation, many social media companies said, well, look, you know, we're not qualified to make these decisions about what's misinformation about COVID. So we'll, we'll use another institution like the CDC as a proxy. Uh, but then, of course, you know, that, that, I mean, Will's written about this before, but that runs into its own issues. Uh, but it's not reserved just to, uh, medical uh, situations with something like uh, hate speech, you could defer to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which itself, you know, has its own uh, issues issues with that. And uh, what what, what long term will be interesting out of the pandemic, I think, is how long term these these platforms learn um, about their legitimacy crises, which is there are just some issues where it's not good enough for them to make their own decisions, but at the same time, it doesn't seem good enough to rely on um, other uh, other authorities. And this is a massive issue at scale. If you consider something like YouTube, where it's hundreds of hours of content per minute are being uploaded, inevitably there will be false positives and false negatives in a content moderation system. Uh, so that's more a PR issue for social media, but the fact is that politically this will be um, continuous, and uh, we we shouldn't expect uh, this to wrap up anytime soon. Uh, the the answer, of course, if you're a libertarian, is look, you know, uh, private firms are allowed to screw up, and uh, there's uh, you know this year has been interesting because you've had the emergence of uh, supposed conservative social media uh, forum like uh, like Parler. Uh, and, and that's that's the kind of market I think we want. The the worry is that uh, the these firms get uh, pressure politically from both sides. That's a good point. I mean, w w what we're basically describing here is a is an oracle problem, which you, we usually talk about in the context of you know uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Like, what's the what's the third party independent uh, entity that's going to rule that yay or nay, that this is accurate or not, this, that has this, but you know, oracles exist off the chain too, right? Like this is an oracle problem. Like Facebook doesn't want to make this decision about what counts as hate speech or what counts as disinformation. So let's find an oracle that's supposed to be independent and, uh, and have and confer legitimacy thus on that decision. Um, and they're having a hard time finding a perfect oracle because the perfect oracle exists. And well, and, and any potential oracle is political. And I think to some extent, they have to really think about the process of building legitimate expertise in house um, so that they can say our longstanding team whose work you have respected for a long time has made this determination rather than the Southern Poverty Law Center or one of our stable of fact checkers. And you see that kind of endless debates just about that and the inclusion of the Daily Caller News Foundation as the sole right-wing fact checker. And on one hand, you'll hear folks who say they don't deserve to be a fact checker. And on the other hand, you'll hear people who say, we need three more like them so that we'll have a balance between right and left fact checking within the program. Um, and I, I think that gets you right to that. You know, once you throw it back to that fact checking, suite of experts well then who they are matters yeah that's a i mean it, again it's a mess it's a well pandora's box to use the metaphor um and i i think it also means we should expect this is not a temporary aberration right this this heated debate over what counts as disinformation what doesn't who the proper authority should be whether it's legitimate or not I, I think this means we should expect that conversation to accelerate over the next couple of years. Uh, you have any feeling for that? Well, yes, I, I think especially we, we just don't know what's going to happen in the wake of the upcoming presidential election, uh, which which I think will just add um, more fuel to the fire of content moderation. Uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion about what kind of especially explicitly political content is legitimate online. Uh, you already have a, a number, and we're, we're recording this in early October, but there's already plenty of commentary out there uh, equating content moderation with election interference, which is this uh, astonishing uh, and, and very interesting, I would say, uh, a move because it's, you know, it, it, you're not just, you know, portraying uh, content moderation as ideologically motivated. Here, the, the attempt really is to say that these private firms, mostly based in California, are a threat to civic institutions themselves, namely that if these 
if these companies are allowed to run however they want to run, they threaten democracy. Uh, and this this is, uh, you know, that's quite a claim. Um, and I, I don't blame people for um, getting upset when they hear something about that. Uh, yeah, I, I think 2020, look, has been defined by this once a century pandemic, and that's very important. And uh, the, the content moderation issues there are important to to analyze. But uh, this, this attitude uh, that content moderation is election interference will continue if, if the president is not re-elected, um, because there will be a significant number of people, um, including some on Capitol Hill and in, in the press, who will insist on portraying content moderation as an interference in an election, which is quite a serious charge. Well, it's, it's really, in a way, an echo of a claim we heard in the wake of the 2016 election, that platforms' failure to moderate uh, specifically foreign disinformation, but also a lot of domestic kind of alt-right speech in favor of the president constituted, if not interference per se, but an allowance of interference, um, mm -hmm. an irresponsible decision to let people interfere. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting as platform moderation has evolved to perhaps become more restrictive or aware of particularly foreign interference, that that claim has made it its way all, all the way around um, the political axis. Well, and there's been that, uh, I just saw the other day, a report out of the UK uh, official, I forget which official government agency put it out saying that uh, they saw no evidence that, um, uh, you know, social media, foreign interference played a significant role in Brexit. Well, it was, that was Cam Cambridge Analytica. They, they were speaking right, specifically right. about Cambridge Analytica and in Brexit. And it was always kind of, well, I got a pitch from them back r right after Brexit that fall, but before the, the American election, I was working for a cannabis policy group at the time. And even then it just felt like smoke and mirrors. There's very little insight into how their data system actually worked and, and all of the emphasis on, on the gimmicks, on the uh, soccer betting lotteries that they use to, to get people's information. But again, nothing interesting about what they were doing with it. So it, it's n nice to see that confirmation, but it's also unfortunate now, you know, four years later, that's a separate narrative out there in the world. And this report isn't going to, you know, Carolyn Caldwell is, isn't changing her mind anytime soon. Right. Yeah. No one's going to, it's not going to move the needle here. It, it is also interesting to me. I mean, I think it's another reminder that this is a minefield that's going to continue and arguably worsen because it, different platforms made different decisions. Uh, Twitter dropped all political advertising, right? Facebook went, went with more of a medium route where they would continue to take, you know, paid for campaign advertisements. All those decisions have been unpopular or, or, or controversial in some corners. Like there is no response from the big social media platforms that makes everyone happy. Um, so I, I think we'll revisit this every four years. I mean, the ten, so far it's been peaking at presidential elections, um, but it looks like it's going to be something that's with us for the near future. Um, oh, in terms of shifting, moving the needle on public opinion, like once a narrative gets sunk down into the public consciousness, it's really hard to change it. And no you know, official report is going to move the needle on that kind of, um, that kind of thing. Uh, I have seen, this is anecdotal, but in my own social media streams, I've seen a lot of chatter among complete, you know, complete non-policy people, just ordinary folks on my, in my Facebook, you know, old college acquaintances, that kind of thing. Lots of chatter about the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. And it's, it's annoying chatter because I, I would, I'm not a fan of the social dilemma argument, um, but it's been striking to me. It's the, probably the single thing from our like tech world that I've seen normies interact with this year in, in terms of like tech policy conversations. Well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Like, and that's 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 below the top level notice. That's that's going on like that's really dispiriting. Um, yeah, I've I've watched the the social media dilemma. It's it's Tristan Harris and a host of other. Um, sort of former tech employees turned tech dissenters. Um, but the documentary really makes our, our problems with social media out to be problems with algorithms and, and therefore misses most of the picture. 
in in my mind. Can you recapitulate that arg- that argument their argument for us? Well, they they um, focus throughout the documentary on how social media's algorithmic pr- provision of content, be it organic content or advertising, manipulates us and causes us to adopt new beliefs or become more radical. But throughout the documentary, it, it ignores non-algorithmic social media almost entirely. There's no mention of WhatsApp and the kind of lynching mobs based on rumors that you see there. And, and that's not an algorithmic product. That's purely messages from other people who you, you follow or are forwarded to you by, by your contacts. That's a big, um, big, big problem in India, right? Yeah, uh, lyn- yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there's very little evidence that, that these algorithms are radicalizing, that it's a supply-side phenomenon rather than a demand-side one. Um, if, as, as they put it, uh, one, in the documentary, the tools that are being created today are starting to erode how society works. It's because these tools allow us to communicate with one another in real time at scale in a way we've never been able to do before, not because the algorithms are tilting us towards things. The internet may have revealed a certain amount of institutional failure and created a terrain in which legacy institutions have struggled to compete or adapt, but it's not a simplistic matter of YouTube recommendations turning your child into a Nazi. And the the documentary really seems to push that and to use fear to to do so, um, which is kind of ironic in, in a documentary that purports to explain how uh, and, and the evils of, of social media selling us fear. It does seem to fixate on the, uh, you know, the algorithm serves up, you searched for a conspiracy video and the algorithm figures out that you like conspiracy videos. So it feeds you more and you go down this rabbit hole. And before you know it, you're part of QAnon, right? Like that's their arc. But I, I'm also struck by how they don't touch on, which is that, Yes, sure. It can play a role in the radicalization of of folks. It gives them serves up uh, a content that they're that folks who are you know predisposed towards that way of thinking are well, looking yeah, for. But it's it's persuasion based on that pre- predisposure. You're worried about your children and vaccines. You're a kind of vegan, natural mother, and you get to cue in on that way because they speak to your concerns about right. chemicals in your food and and. Uh, vaccines harming your children. Yeah. But it can also play the, the flip role, which is it can de-radicalize. It can, I mean, it's, it, it is, it is giving you the information you look for better than a blind search would. And that can be good or bad that can radicalize or de-radicalize. I mean, the whole term radicalization is problematic because uh, as a concept, because we mean something particular by it, which is it makes it, it, it comes close to brainwashing. It removes agency. Well, and there's a normative point. Radical beliefs are bad. Um, right. And often they are, but it's kind of loaded in there. Yeah, um, it is loaded in there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, it's I, – I, I mean I see what you're saying too with the dramatization. It's dabbling in the very kind of fear-mongering it complains about. Um, what has what, – what's the response been? I don't know if you've picked up on like – you know, tech wonk chatter about the social dilemma. Like, I, 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 it feels like it's been a lot more critical than uh, the kind of, you know, uh, ordinary consumer viewpoint. Yeah, I'm sorry that um, I don't know how much I have to offer because I haven't seen the documentary. <laughs> um, okay, maybe yeah. in, in large part because I saw a lot of the commentary on it and it seemed pretty, <laughs> so, uh, oh. <laughs> I said, you know, I've, um, I've also, I, I saw that, um, uh, was uh, Shoshana Zuboff, who wrote this this best selling book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism, seemed to feature quite prominently. And I've been trying to write a review of the book, but I make it about ten pages, and I have you know fifty pages worth of <laughs> notes, and it's become a bit of a Sisyphusian struggle to to get this thing done. I mean, what I will say is, um, it seems like um, a documentary I would I would have a lot of issues with, but yeah, you know, I think that the commentary on it is revealing nonetheless. I mean, the fact that Netflix viewed this as the kind of content to really push uh, and it's being watched by a lot of people um, is telling, uh, you know, people 
Um, it goes back to the paradox we, we talked about earlier, which is people seem to um, use Amazon Prime a lot, but there seems to be some discontent about it as well. Uh, you know, people seem uh, very keen to use a lot of these social media platforms, but apparently under the hood, a lot of people also have reservations. Uh, but we, we should, I think, remember, uh, and this might be difficult for some people to, to accept, obviously, but, you know, the, the, the ideal amount of radicalization on the Internet with a platform that big is not going to be zero. Um, now, the actual amount of uh, what, what it means to be radical and what these radical views entail um, is, is important to define because not all conspiracy theories, I think, are created equal. Right. So if you believe, for example, that the governments around the world are conspiring to make you believe that the earth is round when in fact it's flat, you know, someone says this to you at a dinner party or a happy hour, you view them as, you know, nonsensical people, but relatively harmless. I mean, QAnon has led to actual crimes, right? And yeah, people right, have right. actual harm. So that's, you know. I into the, the hospital ship in New York. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> drove a train at it. Well, right. And so there's there's that. Um, I, I believe there have been reports of kidnappings and other things, right? So that, you know, uh, it, all that is very disturbing to hear about, of course. But again, it goes back to the problem at scale, which is, uh, you, you have a lot of these problems, which is you have not just the content that is directly associated with this sort of thing, but then what about reporting on that content? Or what about people who are within the movement and critiquing it internally? What are, you know, the, All of that is, is, is rather difficult to, to sort out. It's a good point. And it, also it's a reminder that uh, as we lower the costs of um, organization, because I mean, we're talking about social movement organization, QAnon is a social movement, a uh, pseudo-religious social movement. Um, well, so too is BLM, right? Like all of these uh, contemporary social movements have had the costs of access, the costs of organizing lowered by new social media forms. And so you can't like, you can't only have the good and not get the bad. I mean, it, it's, it is the kind of price we pay um, f, f, you know, for the, the freedom to organize in causes that we agree with also provides the freedom to allow people to organize for causes we don't agree with. Um, and I, I don't think we can pick and choose. Uh, and that's, I mean, we can ask the platforms to do a better job of deciding. Like I'm fine and be potentially fine for a platform to say, Hey, we're fine with BLM content. We're not fine with QAnon content. And, and then they can be rewarded or punished by their consumers for taking that editorial stance, right? Um, but uh, the same system, the same web that makes both possible, you really can't tweak the entire web without hurting both, if you will. I, I would um, just, just mention that, that I think portraying a lot of the biggest players in this space as being negligent is a little unfair. Uh, look, look, I, I, I have lit my, my, my criticisms of certain content moderation decisions for sure. But, uh, look, uh, YouTube, uh, which is owned by Google has taken advantage of, uh, the, the company Jigsaw, this project within Alphabet, which seeks to identify people who are going down these rabbit holes of radicalization. Um, you know, it was initially designed for Islamic extremists, but is being used more recently on, uh, white supremacist, uh, content. So, so I think we, we have to be careful in these discussions to be accurate in portraying, in, 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 in describing what these companies are actually doing, because I think describing them as completely negligent uh, is, is, is unfair. I, I found that, that dynamic that, that you were describing in terms of tools used to combat Islamic radicalization now turned to domestic ethno-nationalist extremists, very interesting, because it, it's such a mirror of what we've seen in the broader war on terror, in that w whatever security mechanisms are initially developed and deployed and seen as acceptable in, in a foreign context are eventually seen as at least useful in, in the domestic one and are, are brought home. And just as in, in seeing that plot yesterday broken up kind of bumbling fools attempting to kidnap uh, Governor Whitmer of um, Michigan, it echoes many of the, the plots you saw from uh, kind of nihilistic young Muslims lo looking for meaning through violence, egged on and followed in some ways by law enforcement back in the, the early aughts. This is something that uh, Evelyn Dueck, uh, she did a paper, presented a paper at the Knight First Amendment Center Conference 
um, at Columbia University last fall, where she talked about, um, yes, the the tools that big tech companies have developed in cooperation with you know national governments in like New Zealand and Australia, how they're being turned, you know, their focus is turning from Islamic extremism to domestic terrorism. So uh, that's a that's someone to look up on Twitter if you're interested in this in this topic. Uh, the other thing I'm reminded of is that this is a very old. Um, question, which is that institutions that are created uh, for the suppression of one form of, of social movement act activism or of speech um, will often be swung around to bear on very different groups. I mean, so it doesn't have to just be an online thing. I mean, in U.S. history, it's, it's like the House on American Activities uh, Committee, uh, HUAC, which most people remember as an anti-communist weapon used in the 1950s to go after uh, suspected but mostly not communist spies uh, infiltrating the, the, the federal government. Well, it was actually instituted in the 1930s. Um, its predecessor was the Dyes Committee, and it went after uh, fascists, uh, silver shirts, and uh, American kind of far right rather than far left figures. And then it got swung around to bear on the opposite side of the political spectrum. So these, these tools have a way of, of often changing targets often, and sometimes in a radical way. And then it, it, you, you, they have unintended consequences and uh, uh, there's, there's um, I guess, collateral damage. So it, it, cause it can be hard to tell, especially at scale is someone, um, are they, uh, are, to, to use the historical metaphor, is someone simply sympathetic to communist beliefs on their personal time, or are they spying for the Soviet Union? Those are two very different questions that are very hard to tell the difference between on the outside in the 1950s. To put that in the contemporary context, is someone advancing white supremacy, or are they just being, I don't know, a conservative uh, who is critical of the Kenosha, uh, who, who is supportive of the Kenosha sheriff? I, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, whatever your, the specific example is, um, at scale, it's really hard to tell the difference. And so when a tool gets swung around to bear on a new target, there are folks who aren't necessarily problematic, if you will. At, at scale, it's impossible for moderators to understand the ins and outs and norms of every subculture. There are too many of them. I mean, just looking at English language political subcultures, gets you, you can't hire an expert for ev every single one of them, and they come and go so frequently. Uh, how would you manage that? Let alone if it's Thailand and you're dealing with the ins and outs of ethnic tribal struggles and et cetera, right, right, right. Yeah, and the challenge is coming up with universal rules that work despite that lack of knowledge, which is really hard. Uh, speaking about things that are really hard, so Matthew, why don't you update us on where we're at with Section 230 uh, shenanigans? So you, you've, we've mentioned it a few times here, but it's been, I think we're, we're hitting a bit of a fever pitch right now. Uh, if those who follow uh, the president's Twitter account, uh, he said it in all caps that we should repeal Section 230. You don't get more clear than that. Uh, so, so, yeah, where are we at with Section 230 right now? Uh, well, yeah, this could have been a podcast unto itself. Um, so to try and summarize a year of Section yeah, 230. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, look, uh, for, unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last year, you uh, already should know a little bit about Section 230. But uh, basically, it's the, the, the law that um, protects websites for the vast majority of content posted by users. Uh, now, there have been a plethora of uh, suggested amendments from both sides of the political aisle. Earlier this year, the president signed an executive order mandating the NTIA to ask the FCC to, to, to look into this. Uh, and, and it's just been a, a bit of a mess, uh, mostly because the po politics of this um, seem to be uh, very disjointed. Um, getting uh, Democrats and Republicans to agree on Section 230 reform uh, is, is difficult. But this is actually a rare piece of agreement with uh, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Uh, they both, uh, now for, for different reasons, obviously, but uh, at the moment, I would say that uh, some kind of Section 230 amendment is unlikely, uh, only because 
I can't see the Senate and the House and Republicans and Democrats and those two bodies coming to, uh, together to agree on on what should be done. Uh, but the the problem is that it's it continues to be a uh, good uh, political fuel. Uh, so I, I I imagine that we'll see uh, the, the regular uh, common complaints about uh, big tech being a, uh, being tied in with with Section two thirty, but. Uh, at the moment, it seems like it won't be going anywhere. The one exception to this uh, I should mention, though, is an attempt by uh, a bipartisan group of senators led by uh, Senator Graham uh, to uh, condition uh, Section 230 protections on certain uh, activities aimed at targeting uh, child sexual abuse material. Uh, this was introduced uh, under the so-called Earn It Act. Um, it hasn't passed yet, but uh, in the, the most recent amendment to Section 230 was tied to attempts to tackle human trafficking. Uh, I think if you can hook Section 230 amendment to something like combating uh, this awful material, then it has a, a better chance. But at the moment, uh, you know, given where we are politically, I, I don't see that happening uh, before a new Congress is sworn in. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's my take on the lay of land at the moment. I, I do find some of the um, quite, quite recent, um, really unlikely to pass um, sort of extreme proposed modifications interesting in, in the worldview that, that they reveal. Um, I'm thinking particularly about the recent uh, Senator Kennedy on the, the Senate side and Gosser and Gabbard in the House, um, Don't Push My Buttons Act, which essentially prohibits via removing 230 protections um, any automated delivery of content, any push or, or provision of content to a user that a user does not explicitly select for themselves, click on. Um, and it, it, it feels like uh, the, the Butlerian Jihad or that um, don't speak to me computer meme um, as, as legislation. Um, but I think, you know, obviously something like that is unworkable and, and simply could not pass. Um, but it, it bespeaks a real concern with the extent to which computers and algorithms are understood, rightly or wrongly, to be making decisions for us um, today about what we see, um, about who we communicate with, and, and kind of just takes as blunt a hammer as you could possibly imagine to it. Um, but, but it is uh, novel in its, in its breadth and, and seeming ideological bent. Yeah. We had uh, uh, Max Sklar come on to talk about bots because he's a he's a bot programmer, and um, and talk about artificial intelligence. And it was a reminder that you know if you say bot to an ordinary internet consumer, it has a negative connotation for them. They think of you know Russian inter election interference. They think of I don't know. They they have negative connotations, um, and yet bots are everywhere already. Uh, we're going to have more of them, and they're not all bad. I mean so. Part of the problem is that we're, as we, we create these new mechanisms on the, on the internet that are uh, subsumed, they're below the notice of ordinary consumers, and they, they miss the extent to which um, their experience of the internet relies on these largely anodyne phenomenon, right? Whether it's bots or algorithms, but all they, when, the only time they ever raises to the conscious, you know, to, to the level of consciousness for them is is a negative case, is this is a bad thing that needs something needs to be done about well, the language we use to describe them matters. Um, you know, bot sounds like uh, an alien agency um, as though it it's making decisions of its own in a yeah. non-human yeah. fashion. Um, tweet scheduler, however, it yeah. reminds you that there's yeah. a human in the loop. Um, yeah. And yet yeah. any yeah. kind of tweet scheduler is going to count as a bot by most definitions of, of the term. Yeah, yeah. I, and I do think, too, that even I, I agree with you, Matthew, um, that it's unlikely that we'll get any kind of serious Section 230 reform uh, in the near future. But I, I do think what's disconcerting to me, and we've been talking about Section 230 on Building Tomorrow since some of the earliest episodes. Um, and 
back then section 230 was notable because of how obscure it was i don't think the ordinary internet consumer had ever even heard of this law that shaped the modern internet now more and more people have whether it's because of things like the social dilemma or because of all the tweeting by conservative politicians or uh, by joe biden whoever it's now creeping into the public consciousness and being associated with negative things. Um, and so we're kind of, it, we're shift, the Overton window has shifted from Section 230 reform. That's crazy. No, you know, only real outliers like Josh Hawley would propose a government agency that would, you know, condition Section 230, uh, uh, Section 230 liability shield on non discrimination. But more and more Congress people are getting behind Section 230. Um, you know, uh, some sort of government agency or government role in Section 230. And so what I'm trying to say is the Overton window, both for politicians and for policy wonks and for ordinary consumers has started to shift over the last year or two. And we're kind of, it feels like we're laying the bedrock for a potentially future reform to Section 230. Uh, you know, we're kind of laying the public opinion groundwork for that. Yeah, I mean, maybe so. I guess watch this space. Uh, we yeah, can right. uh, see... Uh, we can revisit in a future episode. My my only comment on that, I suppose, is uh, neither side, I, I think, uh, I'll say with some confidence, neither side is going to get what they want out of this. So remember, look, uh, so Trump and Biden agree on, uh, you know, getting rid of, of 230. Uh, but Trump, is because he views uh, these social media companies as uh, taking part in an anti-conservative crusade, and, and Joe Biden and his allies view these companies as irresponsible because they allow too many right wingers uh, who are crazy to run rampant on the platform, and yeah, also allow yeah. for too much election interference. Um, the, uh, you know, show me a show me a bill that addresses both these concerns that could pass the House and the Senate. Uh, then maybe, um, like I said earlier, once you hook it to something we can all agree is awful, like human trafficking or child sexual abuse imagery, then maybe we're, we're getting somewhere. But uh, I, I do think lawmakers need to, to to consider the actual implications of of reforming a law like this substantially because the risks are significant. Need to, but but will they? That's, what, that's the question. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, and for our listeners, uh, until next time, be well. This episode of Building Tomorrow was produced by Landry Ayers for Libertarianism.org. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, check out our online encyclopedia or subscribe to one of our half-dozen podcasts.